Hi, and welcome everyone. This is Kristen with Ingram Spark. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Building an Online Marketing Plan, featuring Stephanie Chandler and our very own Robin Cutler. Uh, super excited to hear Stephanie today and talk about how to build that marketing plan. Um, but before we get into that, and I hand you over to our co-host, uh, there's a few things that I want to talk about for housekeeping. Um, I'm going to be live tweeting the event, um, and you should see like a little module on your webinar screen that allows you to live tweet as well. We've already pre-populated the tags and um, uh, tagging us in there, so you'll be in the conversation right away using that module. Um, you can also tweet just from Twitter if you'd like, if that's easier. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, there's a widget at the bottom called Q&A. Um, you can put your questions in there. We're going to try to save about five to ten minutes at the end to go over your questions. Um, <clears throat> fear not, if we don't get to them, we will be giving them to Stephanie at the end of the webinar. And then when we place this webinar recording on our YouTube channel, uh, we'll have all of the questions and answers in the comments of that. Um, and you'll also, this is recorded as well. So you'll get a recording uh, via email after the event is over. Um, and then uh, there's also a printable version of the presentation that you can find in the bottom. I believe it's the left-hand corner. Um, so if you <coughs> want to print that out and take notes as we're going along, that's definitely recommended. Um, and again, thanks everyone for joining us. It's, it's been a while since we've done an Ingram Spark session, and I'm super excited that uh, Stephanie and Robin are here. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Robin Cutler. She is the director of Ingram Spark. She ha is a thought leader in the industry. She has pioneered Ingram Spark to be what it is today and is just vigilant about uh, publisher education and, and kind of transitioning the traditional to independent publishing. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Robin. Thanks for being here, Robin. Well, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. At, as Kristen said, it's been a few months since we've had a webinar for Ingram Spark uh, customers, and we're just really thrilled today to uh, have our special guest, Stephanie Chandler. Um, Stephanie is the author of nine books, including the nonfiction book Marketing Plan, online and offline promotion strategies to build your audience and sell more books, which is what we're all wanting to do. Stephanie is also founder and CEO of the Nonfiction Authors Association. And I want Stephanie, uh, at the end of her presentation, to talk a little bit about what uh, the Nonfiction Authors Association is all about, because I know that within Ingram Spark, we have a lot of nonfiction authors and nonfiction content, and, and I think that that association will actually be a good home for a lot of you. Um, so, uh, so do spend some, a little time talking to us uh, at the end, Stephanie, about that association. Uh, there's also yeah. a nonfiction writers conference that she's going to be telling us about that will ha be happening this fall. Uh, Stephanie is a frequent speaker at business events and on the radio, and she's been featured in Entrepreneur Magazine, Business Week, Inc.com, and Wired Magazine. So uh, we are just really, really fortunate and excited to have Stephanie join us today. So without further ado, um, Stephanie, I think I'll let you take it away here. All right. Thank you so much, Robin, and thanks for to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to add a quick little bit more of a background so you understand how I ended up here. I started out like everyone else uh, wanting to become an author. I'm actually a Silicon Valley refugee. I uh, quit my soul-sucking job back in 2003, and I opened a 2,800-square-foot bookstore in Sacramento. And it turns out that owning a bookstore is not as romantic as it sounds. Uh, but while I was in that whole process, um, I decided that I wanted to write business books. I wrote my first book was a business startup guide. I launched a website um, with the goal of building an audience, and it worked. I, it helped me build that audience. I ended up um, selling a book on my own to a traditional publisher. I signed with an agent, sold a couple more books, then got really turned off by traditional publishing 
and the lack of control and just I could go on and on for days about that. In fact, we have some blog posts coming out with Ingram about that. Um, but basically what I did in 2007, I sold the store and I started my own publishing company focused on nonfiction. And in 2010, we had our first nonfiction writers conference and attendees kept asking, how do we keep in touch after this? And then we ended up launching the Nonfiction Authors Association in 2013. And I knew there was a need for those of us who write nonfiction to have our own community. I just didn't understand how great that need was. And um, Today we have 14,000 members. We have chapters meeting all across the U.S., Canada, and we're launching in London this month, which I'm so excited about. So we have a lot going on, and I have a lot of content jammed into this presentation, so be prepared to take notes and, and hopefully download the slides as well. So first, when you're thinking about building your online plan, you really want to think about what is it you want to be known for, and more importantly, you know, what is the audience that you want to serve? We hear the word platform a lot in publishing, and platform simply means audience. Who is it that you want to reach? And there's a reason that traditional publishers want authors with a platform, because if you have an audience, you will sell books. And when you're self-publishing, it's just as important, because you need to have a way to get people to, to buy what you're selling. So this all starts with identifying your niche. And it can be tempting to cast a wide net thinking that maybe you'll reach more people. But you'd be surprised how much better you can connect with an audience when you narrow your focus. And I'm going to go through some examples here in a moment. But the other thing, once you've got your target audience figured out, your next step is to become an influencer. This is a really hot term right now. Um, an influencer is somebody who has a large audience. That could be from a high-traffic website or large social media following. It might be that you have a big uh, YouTube base or you've got a popular podcast. And so the thing about people with influence is that they, they sell more books, they get book deals, they attract corporate sponsors and ad revenue. So, you know, I like to think about my publishing goals in a bigger picture of, you know, if I'm building this audience, I can create a whole business around what I'm building here. So let's go through some examples. This is a friend of mine. His name is Carl Polachek. He is a consultant to IT consultants. Basically, he helps technology companies grow their businesses. Now, when Carl set out to become a consultant, he could have become a general small business consultant, but he decided to stick with his niche of working with technology companies. And as a result, he is a rock star in this small community. He sells thousands of dollars in digital products every month. That includes um, books, e-books, uh, downloadable recordings, audio uh, courses, video courses. He's got uh, well over 100 digital products that he sells. Last year, he landed a six-figure deal with a technology company to license 20% of the content from his books and his blog that they would repurpose in their own newsletters and in their blog and still give him full at attribution. So think about that. You know, he licensed up to 20% of his content, still got the exposure and with full credit for his name and a six-figure contract to boot. It's pretty fantastic. This year, he put himself on a 20-plus city tour. So he announced to his audience, hey, I'm coming to your city. You know, spend $700 and you can spend the day with me in a hotel conference room and I'm going to teach you all kinds of great technology company stuff. And he's had an amazing year um, across the U.S. He's been to Canada, the U.K., Australia. I mean, it's in Phenomenal what he's done with this tiny little niche. Some of you may be familiar with Melinda Emerson. She's known as the small biz lady on Twitter. Melinda did something really interesting. She started something called Small Biz Chat on Twitter several years back when Twitter was just kind of up and coming. And basically what she did is each week she would interview somebody about a small business topic, all on Twitter, 140 characters at a time. Well, it took off like crazy, and today she has over 300,000 followers 
on Twitter to the point she gets so many invitations for speaking and corporate sponsorship that she had to hire somebody just to manage that side of her business. I mean, the influence is so powerful. This is a friend of mine, Patrick Schwartfeger. So seven years ago, Patrick was a mortgage guy. And what was happening in our economy seven years ago? Uh, mortgage guys were having a rough time. And he decided that what he really wanted to do was become a full-time keynote speaker. So what Patrick did is he self-published a book and he started a marketing podcast. And mind you, hardly anybody even knew what a podcast was back then. Um, but that led to him landing a book deal. The first year that he decided to be a speaker, I think he spoke over 60 times that year. As he says it, he spoke in every church basement, trade association, club that would have him. He spoke there. And at the time, his niche was the topic of social media, which was really, really hot and kept him very busy. So fast forward to today, he's well into a six-figure income as a full-time keynote speaker, that's all he does. And he's traveling the globe, living his dreams, and his niche today is big data, which is another really um, powerful, small niche topic. And that's led to a new book. He's done a TEDx talk. I mean, it's just amazing what you can do when you get really focused. Uh, Dana Manciagli called me four years ago. She was a, an executive with a large tech company, and she said, I want to quit my job and become a job search coach. And I thought, wow, okay, <laughs> if that's what you want to do, let's figure out how to make that happen. So she uh, launched her website, got her book done. She landed a national column writing for the business journals about how to find a job, and uh, she also developed an online self-study course that costs $1,000 a seat on how to get your dream job. And, and by the way, she sold 50 seats in that course already this year. But here's what's so brilliant. She decided that her cause has always been military. For whatever reason, she has a soft spot for people who serve in the military. And she decided to sit down and think, what companies sponsor programs for veterans and, you know, people in service. And she went out and contacted a tech company and said, hey, I know you sponsor military. I have an online training course that will help those who are coming out of service get prepared to find a job in civilian life. Well, guess what? She got them to sponsor this course at a discounted rate of $600 a seat. It's a half a million contract, half a million dollar contract for this year alone. And next year, she will have a million-dollar business. How amazing is that? Shasta Nelson is a women's friendship expert. I met her at a writer's conference uh, several years back. And basically, she started out as a life coach. And there's lots of great life coaches out there. But what I see is a lot of them struggle to really narrow their focus and find a niche. So... So Shasta launched a website called GirlfriendCircles.com, which was basically a way to connect women and find friendships. And that became an incredible platform, led to two major book deals. She's been on the Today Show, Katie Couric, uh, you name it. She's built an unbelievable career on a really interesting topic. Now, for you fiction writers, let's give you some examples as well. You know, the thing with fiction is you kind of have to find your thing. You have to find some sort of hook within your book, something that you're passionate about that ties into your writing in some way. So this example here is author Kemble Scott. He writes edgy novels that are set in the south of Market area in San Francisco. And what he did when his first book came out is he created – these really kind of compelling YouTube videos that were edgy, really fit the theme of his books. And by the way, this was before YouTube really took off. Um, but in addition to that, he started a literary journal in San Francisco. So he got to know all the people in the literary community, the bookstore owners, the fellow writers, and he's helping to promote and cross-promote all of them. So imagine when you know your whole literary community in your area and you have a new book coming out. You've made all these friends who are going to want to help support you. 
And ultimately what all of this led to was him getting invited to write a column for the New York Times on uh, San Francisco lifestyle. It's pretty amazing. I don't know this author personally, Darren Beyer, but I stumbled across his website and I thought it was fantastic. He writes sci-fi novels and he is a former NASA engineer. So he also is a consultant on all things space related. And talk about credibility, right, for his author platform being that he's an actual, um, you know, engineer. It's pretty, uh, pretty powerful. Beth Albright writes these really cute romance novels, a series called The Sassy Bells, and they're set in the South. So imagine what her hook is. She writes about Southern living. She shares recipes and sweet tea stories and all these cute stories about Southern living, which appeal to people who are interested in that way of life. Jennifer Weiner is another example of somebody who writes chick lit books. She knows her audience well. Her books cover difficult topics, parenting, weight issues for women, um, divorce, and she also has a platform writing columns for major, major magazines about women's issues. So she has a huge loyal following. It's led to um, big Hollywood movie deals with her novels. And this final example is BackyardChickens.com. And a friend of mine owns this site, Rob Ludlow. He's not an author. This has nothing to do with publishing. But I love to share this example because I talk about the power of a niche. So this site talks about how to raise chickens in your backyard, which apparently is a big trend. And, you know, think about how many website visitors would come to a site like this on a monthly basis. Just kind of take a guess. And I will share with you that this site, talking about how to raise chickens in your backyard, receives over 1 million unique visitors a month. It's astonishing. So it's really built around this online forum where the users help each other with questions. They're not selling any products. The site is fully ad-supported. It's a huge revenue generator all off one funny little niche topic. So I hope I've... Uh, drove, driven home the point that niches really make a big difference in your audience outreach. So once you've got all of that figured out, your next step is to lay the foundation by creating your website. And I view websites a little differently than others. I think that um, you can consider having an author site, but also I encourage authors to consider having a content or news type of a site focused on your niche topic. So, you know, for example, let's say that you're writing about Southern living. You know, you could create a website all about life in the South, and you could write blog posts about, you know, Southern manners and Southern dating, and you could have Southern fried chicken recipes, and you could build a whole site around your topic, which brings people in, and then they say, oh, look, you know, here she is also an author. I would love to read that book. It's, set in, it's about a topic I'm interested in. So I really do encourage authors to think about that. I have always had a content site. I started a site for entrepreneurs, which was my initial target audience. And the site was businessinfoguide.com, and it helped me build an incredible platform that led to a lot of opportunities. And with that, I also have a separate author site, and I view my author site more as a place for media and for speaking engagements. And so, yes, if you're cringing, I am suggesting that you may want to have two different websites, um, but the reality is it's not expensive to host websites, and you'd be amazed at how um, how much bigger your audience can grow when you get really focused on your topic. The other thing about websites today is that it's not that expensive to get web design. Um, so, and a great web design can make you look more, you know, famous and successful than maybe you you are yet. So, do think about those things. Search engine optimization is also a really important factor in your website because you want actually people to find your site. Uh, so you want to be driving traffic. And the foundation of search engine optimization 
is keyword concentration. And by that I mean every page on your website should have one focused keyword phrase that tells Google what that page is about. So you take a keyword phrase, you put it in the page title, the description, the header, repeat it in the content of that page one or two times, and that helps Google find your content. Another really important factor in website design today is that your website be responsive. Responsive means that your website is mobile friendly. So if you're viewing your site on a, a tablet or a mobile phone, your site should automatically adjust and be readable on various devices. Uh, Google is penalizing websites that aren't responsive and it's giving priority to those who are. So if you've got kind of an older website design, now would be a great time to uh, look at getting your website redesigned and set up so that it's responsive. And ultimately, your best SEO, your best optimization of your site is frequent content updates. Google does not like a static website. So if you've got a typical, maybe a five-page author website and it hasn't changed in months, you're probably penalizing yourself with Google because Google gives higher priority to websites that add content on a frequent basis. And the best way to do that is through blogging. Blogging is your most powerful way to drive website traffic. And statistically, the more content you add to your site, the more traffic it's going to receive and the more reasons you're giving Google to find you. So not only can blogs draw lots of traffic, but it also attracts readers when you're writing about topics that they're interested in. Uh, you know, years ago when the recession was starting, I blogged a lot about how I was doing business in the recession and I wasn't going to let the recession affect my business. Well, lo and behold, media um, producers and editors were out there looking for people to interview about the recession topic. I got tons of media interview the, interviews that I never anticipated. My favorite was when Sunrise 7 contacted me. That is Australia's version of the Today Show. And they streamed me in live from Sacramento as the U.S. representative for what was happening in our economy which is pretty hilarious since I haven't balanced my checkbook in a good 30 years. <laughs> so, um, you know, blogs bring people. And, you know, you can have a written blog, you can have a video blog, you could have podcast episodes, or even better, a combination multimedia. Definitely Google likes multimedia websites. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of a blog success that I never expected you know, I, sometimes we put up content and think, oh, this is going to be such a popular post, and then it falls flat. Or we put up a post and we think, uh, you know, I don't know if anyone's going to read this, and it takes off. So this is an example of one I didn't think anyone was going to read, but I had a client say to me back in 2011, she was a new author, and she said, I wish you'd write an, uh, a blog post on how to autograph books. And I thought, well, you know, how complicated is it? You take a pen, you write your name. And then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, you know, there were times when I, all I had was a, you know, cheap hotel stick pen, and I didn't really think about my salutation. And so I sat down and I wrote this article on how to autograph books. Never would I have ever guessed that this post would get shared thousands and thousands of times. And the, you know, net result is it brings people into the website that wouldn't have otherwise found it. So see, this power of content is amazing. Now, the good news is you don't have to produce all of your content yourself. Uh, you can invite others to contribute. You know, reach out to peers and fellow authors and invite them to write guest content for you. Um, create a written um, interview template. This is something we've done for years. So. You know, people who visit our website can fill out an interview and tell us about their business. And if we think it's a good fit, that gets posted. Then we notify the person who submitted the interview, and they will share a link with their audience. And therefore, you're reaching more and more people. Uh, so I love to find creative ways to add content to the site. Another great one is a roundup post. Go out and, you know, find the top 10 best articles in your industry this past week from your peers. 
because your goal here is to serve your audience. It's not just about your content. It's about sharing information they're going to find useful. Your peers are going to appreciate it, so you're going to create friends there, and you're giving your audience content that they're going to enjoy. Um, so, you know, at a minimum, by the way, I recommend um, tr aiming to post at least two blogs per week. And I know that's a lot to ask because we're all so busy. Um, but I, I promise you that when you do this, you're going to see the benefits over time. It doesn't happen overnight, but give it six months. Install the free Google Analytics plugin on your website so that you can monitor traffic. And you're going to see over time, if you're blogging and staying really focused on your niche, that your traffic is going to increase. It just it, statistically, it has to. Uh, along the lines of blogging, I also recommend writing for other websites. You want to find sites that reach your target audience. So, you know, if you write vampire novels, find websites that talk about vampires and offer to write guest posts for them. Uh, the example here is Huffington Post. They have a lot of subcategories, so it's a great target for a lot of authors to aim to write for this site. And Huffington Post is also a phenomenal example of the power of a content slash news site. Right? Ariana Huffington started this site and sold it for um, over a billion dollars, something like that. So uh, pretty amazing. Our slides are moving on their own. So here we go. Let's talk about book reviews. Uh, book reviews sell books, especially on Amazon. The more reviews you can generate, the better. So you know, I recommend get in the habit of inviting people to post a review. If somebody says, hey, I really enjoyed your book, say, hey, thank you. Would you take a minute and post a review for me? Uh, because sometimes all you have to do is ask. Uh, but one of my favorite ways to get reviews is to reach out to Amazon reviewers which are basically the people who've reviewed competing titles in your genre. So you want to go out and look at other books in your genre. Let's say you've written a memoir about uh, dealing with breast cancer. Go out and find the other memoirs about that topic and scroll down to the reviews. Every reviewer has a clickable link that takes you to their public profile on Amazon. And eight times out of ten, you should find that those reviewers list their email address. And sometimes they also have a website link because they also blog about books. And they list an email address because they want to be offered free review copies. So go ahead and reach out to them and say, hey, I noticed that you uh, reviewed XYZ book. I have a book, a similar book that's just coming out, and I'd love to offer you a review copy if you're interested. Uh, and prepare, by the way, to send out Lots and lots of review copies because reviews are just so important. Uh, I've mentioned here some software called Book Review Targeter. Uh, a woman named Debbie Drum created this, and it's such brilliant software. Basically, it automates that whole process of looking for Amazon reviewers. So you can go into Book Review Targeter and type in 10 or 20 or 50 competing book titles. And it will go out to Amazon, crawl all of those book titles, and bring you back a spreadsheet of all the book reviewers that had an email address and or a website address. I mean, it's, it's a huge time saver. So I definitely recommend that. NetGalley is a paid review service. You have to apply to uh, see if they'll accept you, and then you write a check. Uh, but it can be a, an excellent way to generate uh, more reviews, but you will spend some money on that. I also love to target bloggers, industry bloggers. So get on Google and search for sci-fi book review, business book review, memoir book review. Find the websites that are actually writing book reviews. You know, you don't want to waste your time going to a website and contacting them if they don't actually post book reviews. So that's something to think about. I, I can't tell you how many unsolicited books people send me. And I'm not a book reviewer. So you know they could save themselves the time and money and, and ask me first <laughs> and, and save that effort. Um, but also, don't be afraid to ask people you know. Reach out to your mailing list. You do want to be careful um, about that, though, because Amazon has kind of tightened up their policies that you know you don't want 
your mom or your sister writing a review, especially if it looks like your mom or your sister wrote the review, Amazon's going to take that down. Plus, other readers are going to notice that, and, and that doesn't bode well. So, you know, get people who've actually read the book to write the reviews. Also, reach out in online groups. So here's a really cool strategy. Um, I myself happen to be a widow, and I belong to a number of online groups that offer support for, for widows and grief. And that will be a new um, audience for me when I eventually get my book out that's in that topic area. So imagine what's going to happen a year or two from now when I have a book come out that's you know for the widow community. And I've already been an active member in a number of communities that reach tens of thousands of people. And I say, hey, my book has come out. It's going to sell like crazy. So find those online communities that um, you can get involved in that reach your target audience and get involved before your book comes out because then they'll know you. You can reach out to the community manager and say, you know, hey, I've been around a while. My book's coming out. Is it okay if I let people know? Um, so I've added a link here. There's additional uh, review sources over. It's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash bookreviewsources.com. It's totally free. It's just a blog post. All right, podcasting. Now, this is such a hot opportunity for authors. You know, podcasting's not new. It's been around a while, but it's kind of uh, reaching its tipping point right now. And I kind of view podcasting as where blogging was 10 years ago. Today, we have millions of blogs, but 10 years ago, there were thousands. Right now, there are thousands of podcasts. There are not millions of podcasts. And podcasting is a high priority with Apple. If you have an iPhone, you cannot delete the, the podcast app off your iPhone. It's automatically there, and it's not going anywhere. And Apple has also invested heavily in its CarPlay app. You'll see the, the picture on the screen here. So it's installed in hundreds of car makes and models right now where you've got basically an iPhone screen right on your dashboard of your car, including the podcast app. Now imagine what this is going to do to traditional radio. When more and more people are discovering podcasting, which are basically talk shows, and there's all kinds of niche topics. You can listen to podcasts about parenting, about health and fitness, um, about how to sell on eBay, about managing your finances, um, about people who love vampires. I mean, there's all kinds of niche topics. Now, for you as an author, this is an opportunity because you could potentially create your own podcast show. It's not very difficult to do. It's also very inexpensive. All you really need is a good microphone for under $100 and to set up syndication. Uh, Liberated Syndication is the site that you can go to, libsyn.com. And for less than $10 a month, you can have your podcast recordings syndicated to iTunes and other um, podcast outlets. So uh, think about this opportunity because you can shape a podcast any way you like. You could have a weekly program that's 30 minutes long or an hour long. You could have a daily program that's 5 or 10 minutes, a quick tip. You know, it's really up to you. And so if you're not already listening to podcasts, I encourage you to, you know, download some, pay attention to what you like and don't like, you know, I've personally gotten really addicted to podcasting. I think it's fascinating and fun and interesting. And if you're somebody who likes to learn a lot, this is a great way to do it. Conversely, if you don't want to host your own program, go be a guest on other people's podcasts. The ones that are interviewing people need guests. Some of these programs are five days a week. So go find the programs that, once again, reach your target audience and figure out um, their their uh, submission form. How do you submit yourself as a potential guest for the program? Next up is video. You know, YouTube is the second largest search engine next to Google, and it's also owned by Google. So you may have noticed that when you search something on Google, video is um, gets a high priority. It's always returned in search results related videos. Uh, and so and this is another area where you never know what kind of content may take off. 
this example I've included here is a guy named Judson Lapley. He's a keynote speaker. And he created this funny clip of what, that he calls the evolution of dance that he uses in his keynote speeches where he does all these this different mashup of the twist and the mashed potato and all these different dances. And it's hilarious. And it went viral on YouTube. Today it's got almost 300 million views. Imagine that. 300 million views. He ended up on the Today Show and just all kinds of amazing opportunities. So if you can do something visual um, that that translates well in video, if you're comfortable in video, i got to tell you, I'm not somebody who's great in front of a camera. Uh, so I, video is not my medium, but if you are, by all means, set up your own uh, YouTube channel. You don't even have to spend a lot on production. In fact, a lot of times people prefer the underproduced videos because they look more authentic. Um, also, you know, on the topic of video, Facebook Live is a big deal right now. Facebook really wants its users on video. And you may have noticed when people use Facebook Live, it sends you a notification if you're a, a friend or a fan of that page. Uh, and it's getting a lot of attention right now. I think it's a great thing to use maybe if you're at a live event or you're announcing your book launch or you can do something really captivating. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity right now with video. Uh, community is an underlooked opportunity. I really believe this. I, I mentioned uh, online groups and forums. Find your topic, get involved there, or better yet, start your own online community, maybe a group on Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, and you know, as the leader of a group, you get a lot of exposure. But don't overlook your own backyard. So uh, meetup.com is a great site for this. Meetup has, is a social site where you can um, find local events. You might find bunko groups or business groups or hiking clubs and things for singles. And so a number of years ago, I decided to start a meetup group in Sacramento for speakers. I wanted to connect with other people who were also speaking. We didn't really have a, any kind of speakers group here. So I started the Sacramento Speakers Network on a whim late one night, and I hosted the first meeting at a Starbucks with four people. And the next month we had six, and the next month we had eight. And uh, over time, that grew to be the largest business meetup group in the Sacramento area with over 2,000 members. And what I hadn't anticipated was that it was going to allow me to make the most incredible connections in my own backyard. Uh, we had the media covered us many, many times. We invited them in to speak for us. Uh, I got to know all the fellow speakers and the, the influential people with audiences that we invited to speak to our group. So, um, you know, just don't overlook those opportunities in your own backyard. And also think about trade associations. Is there an association that reaches your target audience? And if so, can you get involved? Can you write for their newsletter? Can you contribute to their blog? Can you go speak at their events? These are things to start kind of getting you thinking outside the box a little bit. And speaking of speaking, uh, speakers sell books. And it's really easy to get started as a speaker. In my experience, most authors are, are look forward to speaking or want to speak. So I encourage you to do that. Um, there is a trade association for darn near everything. Architects, coaches, retired teachers, executives. I, uh, a few years back, I spoke at the Rigid Plastics Manufacturers Association. These, this is an association of the people who create that awful clamshell packaging. They have their own association. Who would have ever guessed that? Um, but the point is that there's an association for everything, and these associations often have weekly or monthly meetings, they have annual conferences, and they need speakers. Um, also, chambers of commerce, local schools, from grade schools to colleges to trade schools to um, uh, high schools, you name it, they need speakers. Uh, so don't be afraid to pitch yourself. And here is the secret to getting started. Put a speaker page on your website. It really is that simple. Add a speaker page, list the topics that you cover. Uh, if you've got any past testimonials, put them up there or start collecting them as you go. 
Uh, and if you need to get some experience with speaking, go join a local Toastmasters chapter. That's a great way to learn um, the, the art and craft of speaking. And then as you get a lot of these free engagements under your belt, by the way, you're going to be selling books at the back of the room and signing them when you're done. But that can also lead to becoming a keynote speaker if that's something that interests you. And keynote speakers at conferences make five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 and up, and they get all of their travel paid. So speaking is a powerful way to grow your author business. Uh, next up is email marketing. It is not dead. It is um, as powerful as it ever was when somebody gives you their email address or giving you permission to market to them. Uh, the thing is that it's harder than it used to be because we don't want to give up our email addresses anymore because we're all inundated with email and we've been burned by the marketers that annoy us with their emails. So, you know, my, a couple of thoughts on email. First of all, you need to give incentive to get people to join your mailing list whether that's the first chapter of your book, or maybe it's a downloadable report, or an audio recording, or a series. Um, you know, think about something that would inspire people to actually want to give you their email address. And then you want to have a sign up on your website. So you need a commercial email tool, such as Constant Contact or MailChimp. Um, this is very inexpensive tools that allow you to put a sign up box on your website in managed commercial email, there's a lot of guidelines that you have to follow with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, but if you use one of these tools, you're, you're covered. You don't have to worry too much about that. But here's the other thing about email. Once somebody has given you the privilege of having their email address in your system, respect it. Give value in the emails that you send. Uh, don't oversend them. I remember signing up for an author's mailing list last year, and it was an author whose book I really enjoyed. It was a marketing book. thought it was great, so I signed up for the mailing list, and the, you know, the next thing I know, I'm getting daily emails trying to sell me something. It was so obnoxious. So I really believe in respect your mailing list, give them value, figure out what they care about, and, and if you approach it from that way, you'll have a loyal subscriber base that will be excited when your next book comes out. Now, I'm going to bring this all home with uh, some quick social media uh, tips for you. First of all, the thing about social media is that it's not a fad. It's not going away. So for those of you who kind of hate it, um, I'm sorry to say that, you know, as authors, we really need to embrace it. It is a powerful way to cultivate and communicate with your audience. Um, the good news is you don't have to do it all. You don't have to have Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. You don't have to do it all. Choose two and do those well. Or better yet, start with one and do that well. Um, for most people, Facebook is kind of the default platform. It's you know the behemoth of all of these. Uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, also great. If you're reaching a, a younger audience, Instagram is the place to be. Uh, but you know the advantages of social media are that um, you know number one, it can drive traffic to your website. So when you're blogging and you share your blog posts on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, you're going to notice when you're tracking your traffic that you're bringing traffic to your website. That is my number one favorite uh, benefit of social media. Number two, I really view it as a mailing list building tool. So one strategy that we use with the Nonfiction Authors Association is we create a lot of free reports and we'll go out and promote those on Facebook. We'll spend $100, $200 to promote a post and get tons of people to register to download the report and build the list that way. So you'd be surprised the benefits of social media. And again, if you start slow, you know, do one really well, maybe add a second, and you'll see some value. From the perspective of the content to share on social media, I, an author said to me once, I feel like when I'm on Twitter, I'm standing in the corner at a cocktail party talking to myself. And I thought, wow, that's a great example of what it feels like when you're just getting started. Like, is anybody listening? Is anybody out there? Um, so, you know, my advice here is it's think about giving value. So you're going to share your blog post, share news and, and blog posts from other websites, your peers' websites. Don't worry about competition. Just be um, valuable and serve your audience, and they're going to appreciate that. I also love um, quick tips, quotes, 
you know, images, uh, funny memes do great, uh, motivational quotes do great, quick tips, all those types of things, infographics. So, you know, start to think about your strategy and then pay attention to what gets a lot of traction on social media um, because then you can do more of that. And then I'm going to give you my uh, favorite Facebook power strategies because, I, you know, Facebook is really – it's a great platform. Most audiences can be found here. You know, it has become a pay-to-play to, pay network. So when you have a Facebook page and you share a blog post, you're lucky if 5% of your page fans see it because Facebook has manipulated the algorithms, you know, saying that they're trying to make their, their news feeds more friendly, but really what they want to do is get us to advertise. But here's the thing, Facebook advertising is still incredibly inexpensive compared to traditional advertising. If you wanted to go buy an ad in a glossy magazine, you would spend thousands of dollars. You can spend as little as $20 to get advertising on Facebook. So I mentioned that we give away a lot of free reports, and so we will spend $100 and um, put up a, 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 a post on go download this free report and people register on a on an opt-in page. They get the report and then we've built the mailing list. But here's the thing. After you sponsor that post, when you go into that post, as you see on the screen here, and you click to see who liked that post, Facebook gives you these little invite buttons. And you can just scroll down and anybody who liked the post but wasn't yet a fan of your page just go click on invite, 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 and it's going to send a notification to those people inviting them to like your page. Now, not everyone's going to respond to that, but a percentage of people are. So not only did you get value from your advertising dollars by building your mailing list and cultivating an audience who appreciates this content you gave them, but you've also increased the number of fans on your page. So it's really powerful. I absolutely believe in Facebook budgets. I don't think it's a great place to announce your book to a cold audience, but it is a great place to cultivate an audience so that when your book comes out, you have a warm audience that's interested in actually buying the book. So finally, I'm going to bring this all home with um, a, a discussion on gardening. Now, I had, when I talk about this live, I will ask the room to raise your hand if you're a fan of gardening. And usually about half the people raise their hands. And then I'll ask, raise your hand if you're a fan of marketing. And usually a little less than half will raise their hands. So I myself am somebody who hates gardening. I don't like dirt. I don't like the heat. I really hate bugs. I kind of loathe gardening. But what I like about gardening is the end result, right? I like having a beautiful yard, so I do it, even though I don't like it. Now, many of you probably feel the same way about marketing. You don't like it. You just want to be an author, and you're busy. By the way, very few authors have the luxury of working on their books and promoting them full-time. We all have day jobs, even the New York Times bestsellers. So we just simply have to make marketing a priority, so I, I like to encourage you to think about it this way. What would happen if every day you walked out in your yard and you planted three seeds? What would happen over time? You would ultimately have a really beautiful garden, right? So what if you approach your book marketing in the same way? Every day you planted three seeds. You wrote a blog post. You pitched yourself as a guest for a podcast. Uh, you researched an industry blogger and contacted them. If you did three things every day to market your book, I promise you that over time you're going to have a beautiful garden. It's going to build your platform and you're going to sell more books. So I hope that that drives home the point. I know that I went through that all very, very quickly, but Robin, I would be love to take some questions. Well, Stephanie, this was so great, and I love the garden analogy. I, I actually love to garden as opposed to, uh, to where <laughs> your stance is about gardening. I love to get dirty and um, and be out in my garden probably better than just about anything I do. So, um, but but that's a great analogy. I I have one question for you. Um, yeah, I'm just really curious what you talk to the rigid plastic association about. <laughs> 
<laughs> the clamshell packaging people, they um, actually hired me to come in and speak about um, social media. So this was several years back when social media was a hot topic, and I did a lot of paid speaking around that topic to all kinds of industries because there were not enough social media speakers out there. So, And I, it was a highly entertaining group, let me tell you. It was really funny. Oh, they nice. made fun of themselves. <laughs> that just shows, uh, to make your point, you know, how you as an author, you know, can transcend uh, what you're writing about to reach, you know, whole new audiences and, and potential readers for your work. So that was I got it. Share another quick example. A friend of mine just spoke at the Association of Square Dance Callers. Now wrap your head around that. And there were like hundreds of people at their annual conference, the Association of Square Dance Callers. Now if you've written, um, you know, a cowboy novels, guess where you should be spending your time or speaking? You know, it's just so fascinating to me, all the, the – ways that we can find marketing opportunities a little bit outside of the traditional box. That's really great. And I do want to sort of announce here, and uh, Kristen, who uh, started this webinar, she's the marketing manager for Spark, so she will be proud of me um, when I announce that we're actually going to start an Ingram Spark podcast. And so all of our listeners should be um, should be waiting to uh, hear more about that. But uh, we're really excited about that, too. Excellent. So, Kristen, do you um, uh, have some questions that have come in that would be great for Stephanie to respond to? We do, and we have just about nine minutes left. Um, so I'll pick out a few. And just to remind everyone, if we don't get to all the questions, um, we do have a YouTube channel. It's Ingram Spark uh, YouTube channel, Ingram Spark uh, YouTube dot. YouTube.com slash Ingram Spark. There we go. Got it out. Um, and we have a bunch of different webinars on there. We'll be posting this webinar recording along with the question and answers in the comments section on that. So um, just go there uh, if you don't get the answer to your question today. We did have quite a few come in. Um, I'm going to start with one from Larry, he wanted a little bit more clarification around the website. So he's wondering um, if you're suggesting authors should have two websites, one for content and one for their book. What about multiple books? Um, is the author's website about the author or about the book? So can you go into a little bit more detail on that, Stephanie? Yes, awesome question, Larry. Thank you. I do not typically recommend creating a book website unless that's the only book you ever plan to write. Because, you know, what happens, I've, I've authored nine books. If I had a website for each book, you know, I'd have to pull my hair out. It would be such a pain to manage that. So that is one of the reasons why I love a content site. So if you can focus on, and basically we're talking about a blog site or some sort of a news site where you're focused on whatever your niche is and drawing people in to that. And then you view your author site. Um, while certainly you can have a page for each of your books, and you're certainly talking about your books there, but I view my author site more as the place where the media is going to go to find me or contact me about um, an interview, and also for speaking. It's where I present myself as a speaker. So, um, you know, book sites are tricky, and there are certainly um, people out there who would disagree with me, but I personally would rather drive all of my traffic to one main site versus having to have a handful of different sites. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and I agree totally with that. Great. So this kind of goes hands in, it kind of, this question kind of goes hand in hand with that. Um, um, this person is wondering, for the content site, do you think it would be worth converting your author blog to that content site, or do you think it's best to have your author site, your blog, and your content site? Well, it depends. If your author site blog is focused on a niche topic and it makes sense to put it on your content site, absolutely. Where I see some authors get in trouble is that they're, they've got a blog, but it's not focused, right? So they've written about their recent vacation or their kids going back to school and here's a great recipe I found. And if it's not focused, it's confusing your audience, first of all. 
Um, but if it is focused and if it is um, within the theme of your niche that you've carved out for yourself, then absolutely, or maybe you just have that redesign into more of a, a news-looking type of site. Does that help? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I did me, so. Um, okay. Uh, Doug wants you to expand a little bit more on responsive websites. So can you, I, you sure. said that it means mobile friendly, um, but can yes. you do a little bit more deep in that? Yeah, so you maybe if you've pulled up websites on your your you know um, smartphone, you may have noticed sometimes it's really hard to read a website because it hasn't then it's not a responsive website. It's not adjusting to the size of the device you're viewing it on. Um, so that is key, that your website, go pull it up on your phone right now. And does it properly adjust? Is the font readable on a tiny little phone? And if it's not, your site is probably not responsive. Google also has a free tool that will you type in your URL and it will tell you if your site is responsive. Um, so go to Google and Google... Um, is my website responsive, and it'll take you to whatever that tool is, and you can type in your URL and find out. But chances are, if you had your website designed two or more years ago, it's probably not responsive. And as far as finding affordable website design help, because I get asked this a lot, um, first of all, ask somebody whose website you like, a fellow author, or if you know somebody who's got a great site, ask who designed it. But I also am a big fan of Upwork.com. That's U-P-W-O-R-K.com. It's a directory of freelance providers, and you can find website designers all around the world who can do uh, great designs for literally just several, several hundred dollars. Not You don't have to spend thousands necessarily to have a, a really good site design. And I also recommend WordPress. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, let's, let's see, we had a few more website ones come, come in. Let me take a look and see if there's any that we can bounce off here. I think um, at some point we need to do a whole webinar on the importance of a website, uh, the basics of a website, you know, how to get started. I, I think that's one of the, the missing ingredients um, for a lot of authors. They don't understand the importance, uh, and, and it's kind of the basic building tool. Don't you think, Stephanie? I do. I talk about that a lot because, you know, if let's say you create your author blog over at blogger.com. Well, you don't own your, your URL. You've yeah. got to have your own domain. I mean, there's a lot of little details that authors don't realize, and you can save yourself a lot of heartache down the road if you get it done right the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys actually just answered one of the questions <laughs> very perfectly uh, without even knowing it. Um, Christine was wondering if it is imperative for an indie author to have websites. So I think you nailed that. Oh, um, heck yes. Heck yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? So going back to when we were talking about Amazon reviews and things like that, um, Valerie has found that Amazon is now looking at your followers on Facebook and taking down comments or reviews from Facebook uh, followers. How, like, have you heard that? How do you handle that kind of situation? I have not heard that specifically. I absolutely have been hearing that um, reviews are being taken down. But, you know, the bottom line is make sure you're getting verified purchase reviews. So, um, you know, if it's all, if all of, if 20 of your 25 reviews are from people who haven't purchased your book from Amazon, Amazon's going to be suspicious, right? And so it, there's a couple ways to make sure it's a verified purchase. If you're sending out a review copy to somebody, um, you could uh, purchase it yourself from Amazon and drop ship it to that person. Um, or you can use Amazon's Give as a Gift option on the Kindle side. And a lot of people don't even pay attention to this, but you can give the Kindle version of your book to somebody through email. So you have to go in and purchase it yourself, pay your $2.99 or your $5.99, and then Amazon has this form that you fill out where you give the, the um, person's email address and their name, and it sends them an email and says, you know, you've received this book as a gift. You can download it here to your Kindle. 
Now, two caveats with that. The recipient doesn't have to take accept the gift. They can use the money that you spent on it and put it toward a different purchase. Um, but the other thing is if they do accept the gift um, and they download the book and read it right away, then it's going to show up as a verified purchase when they review the book. So those are a couple of little it's insider secrets to how to make those Amazon reviews work. But I'd be careful you know, that you've got a good ratio of verified purchase reviews versus, you know, not verified. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up with one last question. I think this will kind of hopefully be a little bit of a, a formal, like, takeaway wrap-up question. So, um, and just again, everyone, if we didn't get to your question, we have them. Um, right now, if you want to put more context to find behind the question that you asked originally, um, some of you asked questions while we were in the middle of the presentation, um, and the context might be lost. So if you want to define those questions and put them in the Q&A again, that would be great, and then we'll have more context for answering them um, after the webinar. Um, so last question we want to ask to kind of wrap everything up is in your uh, expert opinion, Stephanie, um, what are the most effective strategies that cost no money? Blogging. I don't know if you want to do like a top three or top four strategies that are like... Blogging, yeah. Blogging and social media, that combination okay. right there is a must for authors. I know you resist it. I know you're busy. I know you don't want to do it. I struggle to do it too to keep up with it. Um, but somehow discipline yourself. You know, sit down uh, one one day a month and write eight blog posts, and then you're done for the month. And you can pre-schedule your social media posts with a tool like Hootsuite.com. Um, you still want to be personally involved in touching your social media, but a, you, there's a lot of time management strategies with social media. I could give you a whole presentation on that. But from a free perspective, and honestly, if you did nothing else from my presentation today, Start blogging twice a week, and and in six months compare where your traffic was, because it is going to make a huge difference, and and only if you're really focused on your audience. It's got to be cohesive. It's got to be focused on your niche. It's got to be serving your audience and giving value. I hope that helps, and I really appreciate you all for joining us today. This has been a lot of fun for me. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Robin, very much for joining us. Um, and just real quick for everyone on the phone, thank you for joining us. Um, keep in mind this will be on our YouTube channel. You'll also receive an email with the recording. Um, and, um, you know, be on the lookout for the podcast and the future webinars. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.